got um, that hey. old people being in and if we want to go ahead and get started and as people come in, then we can, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I'm going to tell you more about this than we're done because it's really oh, boy. So yeah, so. Uh, so quick, just, uh, just let you an introduction, just wanted to welcome you here to uh, Indy Reads. Uh, have you been here to the space before or at our old space? Old space. Old space? All right, cool. So yes, we just opened up in November. Uh, we do like to remind people that um, one out of six adults in Indianapolis can't read uh, at a, can't, can't, excuse me, can't read above a fifth grade reading level. So all the money that we raise here at the bookstore goes directly to uh, help our students who are in our high school um, diploma classes and our um, English Second Language Literacy classes. So purchases, cash donations, volunteer hours, all go to that. If you have any questions about our mission, please seek to, seek to talk to me after uh, the event. Um, but I would like to uh, welcome you and welcome Julia Whitehead and Nikki, I keep saying Michael, sorry, Nikki, Mara here to uh, speak about their writing for Write Like a Legend. So thank you so much for joining. There you go. And we wait for the green light, though. It is ready to go. No, it's it's on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's red for some reason on these cameras instead of green. <laughs> um, so, would you like to begin? Well, I, I I could. I um, she's already said something about you, Julia, but um, I find you to be an excellent writer with a lot to share. So I'm glad that you're here sitting next to me. And Julia is the president or uh, CEO of the. Donegan Museum and Library down in Indianapolis and uh, has a, a formerly a terrific career at Eli Lilly and then uh, she's a former Marine. You don't want to upset her, so please don't ask any questions that might upset her. She's uh, trained in small arms and uh, she, she's dangerous. So, but today she's smiling and laughing, so I think it's going to be okay. And, uh, She's got great writing skills, and I have been pleased to work with her, and um, I've given her a few suggestions on her book, and she has given me a few suggestions on mine, um, which makes for a very nice uh, partnership. So today we decided we would just show up together, and uh, that's how we came to be. So I think we've got, uh, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from Julia today. So thank you, Nikki. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> but um, so if you don't know about Nikki, he has been um, he's the owner one of the one of the owners of the Indianapolis Business Journal. And so we talk about writers. Well, Nikki's been a writer for um, pretty much his whole life, considering law school and all of that. But this is a collection of all of the um, articles that he wrote, the um, columns he wrote for the Indianapolis Business Journal um, over these, what, 1998 to 2019, um, and often serving as that voice for common decency in the community, a lot of social justice related issues um, that Mickey has covered in addition to business related things, politics and stuff. But um, really, it's the, the, the overlap in, so I, I like biography. That's what, you know, even when I was at Eli Lilly, I was interested in the biography of Colonel Lilly um, and, and before that, other, other biographies. But um, I think something that's kind of an interesting overlap with Vonnegut and, and Mickey is um, that the journalism, the very clear sentences, um, trying to get the point across in, in language that people can understand, but also, you know, raising the bar a little bit to get us to think about, um, to get us to think about things. And uh, I want to read this, I, I want to thank our friends at Indie Reads for thinking, even thinking about hosting us, and we both, you know, have the, these books out. Um, and so Mickey uh, is among the many other things from the being a lawyer and the, the IBJ and um, he runs a camp called Mickey's Camp that is for, uh, it's like an adult summer camp and you meet people in the community in all walks of life um, and you know just make great friendships and 
that takes place every every summer. Um, but he's also written crossword puzzles for the New York Times, and so this is one of his crossword puzzle books. But the title is Indie Reads, the title of this particular section. I'm just going to read a, a paragraph um, since we're here, and that seems special. Indie Reads is the only pro-literacy accredited organization in central Indiana that uses trained volunteers to provide free reading, writing, and life skill instruction to adults through one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Those volunteers have positively impacted thousands of students. For a few years, I provided crossword puzzles for its annual fundraising event, each featuring a specific letter of the alphabet. And this is one of those crossword puzzles that he uh, provided. Do and any of you have... work crossword puzzles? You do? Well, um, I think we brought the books. Yeah. I think we have, yes, we have some crossword puzzle books. We, we, oh, we do? Okay. School. So my daughter lives in Florida. She has all the clues. And oh. she tells us the clues and we get them. Oh, so oh that's so fun. See. Well, it's we, it a little bit more challenging. So, well, no, I, that, uh, I, that you can buy it here? Yeah, we brought it from the Vonnegut Library. Oh, yeah. it's not very much money. So it's, yeah, it's a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> and it supports the good cause. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, you know, to mention that. And My initials are in that puzzle. I know, and I think Jinky's are too. Somewhere <laughs> hidden. So that's that's a. I think you like that because it's. I tell a little story or a little joke before each puzzle. There's no there's no crossword puzzle book like that. So if you like crossword puzzles or even if you just want to tinker with it, I think the stories or the jokes are kind of fun and the answers are all in the back, so you can't go too far wrong. Teacher's <laughs> edition, right? I like kind of like that book. And so another. Um, the reason this event is called Write Like a Writer, that comes from a, a Vonnegut quote. I'm going to read you a, a longer, uh, or a, an excerpt from something Vonnegut wrote on writing with style. And he said, why should you examine your writing style with the idea of improving it? Or why should you examine your writing style with the idea of improving it? Do so as a mark of respect for your readers, whatever you're writing. If you scribble your thoughts any which way, your readers will surely feel that you care nothing about them. They will mark you down as an egomaniac or a chowderhead, or worse, they will stop reading you. The most damning revelation you can make about yourself is that you do not know what is interesting and what is not. Um, and so... Well, the, Ronnie said something about everything. Yeah, he did. <laughs> He did, and he did a little something uh, on everything too. Yeah. It was art or humor. Um, but let's start with the first thing he says as far as tips for writers. Use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel that time was wasted. So let's talk about your book. It was your first fiction after writing a number of other um, a, num a number Yeah, that's of my seventh book. Well, that includes the Crossword Puzzle compilation as well. So, uh, but it's the first novel. You could read what um, my wife said if you want. It's on the okay. back. Sex, mayhem, and medical mysteries? Where did my husband come up with all of that? And that's Janie, the lovely Janie <laughs> over here. So there's a, there's a lot um, in this book to engage the reader, hold yeah, interest. Yeah, we're talking about writing, I, I mentioned the fact that writing fiction is a whole lot different than writing nonfiction. Um, my first six books were nonfiction, and they ranged over a variety of topics. But your material, if you're a good researcher, your material's right there. And you don't have to make anything up, you shouldn't. And, um, and so it's not coming out of your imagination. Uh, writing is hard work, and in each one of my books I took about a year uh, to write, particularly this one, which took um, more, more than a year, but it was during uh, quarantine, so we had plenty of time. But other books, for example, I wrote two biographies, um, one called 19 Stars of Indiana Women and one 19 Stars of Indiana Men about men and women that you've probably heard of, maybe know, uh, some yes, some no, some people that you've probably never heard of, 
all extraordinary people who would be good. One of my criteria would be that we have to be good role models for our kids. And these books are in pretty much all Central Indiana schools right now. And they're kids, I don't remember what grade, fifth or sixth grade, they, they have to pick somebody that they want to emulate and they write reports, etc. And uh, my books have been good reference materials for, for that. But uh, all I had to do was, and they had to be alive also, because it couldn't be a good role model if they weren't alive. But um, I um, so interviewed each one of these people and did lots and lots of research. Gathered the material, but the material's right there. Now I had to put it down in the uh, way that uh, elementary school kids and high schoolers could understand and relate to. So it's a different challenge than coming up with a whole group of fictional characters and trying to figure out how they interact and what their lives are all about. And, and so um, it was just a completely different skill. Are you writers or would be writers? Yeah. And is it fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Writing? Huh? Nonfiction. Nonfiction. Yeah. And um, I think I love to read nonfiction. I think I read maybe three to one nonfiction. But we were um, on vacation a while back, and uh, it's a nice time to take a. Uh, what they say back here, they have a big sign, beach books. It's nice to take a beach book for a, for a change. But um, books like my biography were very fulfilling to write. And uh, I enjoyed doing that. And, and um, I wrote a book about the Indiana University Rose Bowl team. It's called Cinderella Ball, because they were a Cinderella team. And that involved tons and tons of research and interviews with you know, virtually all the football players of the of the day. That's 1968 is way before you were born, I'm sure. But um, 68, Indiana University won the Rose Bowl. I mean, went to the Rose Bowl, and they'd never been to the Rose Bowl before, and never went after it. So that was their year, and it was a fun book because they were underdogs the whole, every, just about every single game, and they won almost every game. And so it's a fun book to write, again, nonfiction. Um, but uh, fiction is a whole different ball game. Well, and we have that. We also have the football book for sale. And, and it's, you know, it is about the football team and that sort of thing, but it's um, for someone like me who's interested in, in history, it's not just about football games. It's, you know, some of these players were. Um, had served in the military and they were coming into, um, you know, to college on the GI Bill. And I mean, there's a bigger story going on with, with that book um, if you're not a huge football fan, which I have been once in my life. I, I want to tell you a little bit yeah. about, like, if I may, about some techniques that I picked up. So this is not, I, I'm a, I'm a uh, business school graduate and then law school. So nobody taught me how to write and probably should have. But I worked very hard at trying to be a good writer, but I picked up a few tips since that's kind of the subject of our talk today. Um, one is you can't write a whole bunch of stuff and uh, telling you, the reader what this character is all about. You have to write the with the character doing something, showing something, so that you will understand what the character is all about. So instead of telling about, you have to show. And um, I have uh, a character in this book, and I think you'll like her. I, I like her very much. Her name is Betsy. And Betsy, um, at the, to bring my science fiction book along, Betsy does something quite impulsive. And so rather than say in the beginning of the book, Betsy is an impulsive person. I constructed scenarios where she acted impulsively. And so when she does act impulsively to bring my uh, story into line, you as a reader will say, well, of course she did that. I know her already and she does act impulsively. And, and I didn't have the reader, the writer, to tell you that because 
and just show you that she has a few times. So, um, so that's one thing, show and don't tell. Another thing that, that I learned you have to avoid is what I would call an information dump. So you want the reader to know a lot of stuff, but you can't just sit there and write pages and pages of information that you want the reader to know because it's not very interesting. It's not entertaining. It's not the best way to get your point across. So you have to avoid what I would call, and I don't know if anybody ever uses that term, the information dump. And you have to have this characters have dialogue, and and they they sh they show uh, what the reader what the writer wants them to show you, but not through just pages of dictation. Yeah, narration, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a couple things that I picked up that I think might be worthwhile in your writing and to kind of think about and make you a little bit better better writer. Well, in Vonnegut's number two um, piece of advice is give the reader at least one character he or she can root for. What would you say about your book and, and that one, at least one character to root for? Well, I think I have a few characters that you're just going to love. I also have some evil people. Yeah. But, um, I know you're not here to listen to us, but why don't you sit down and make us feel a little bit better? Yeah. Oh, yes. You got five yes. minutes you yes. can yes. spend with us. Yeah. 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 So, um, so your characters. You have um, one of my favorite characters is Ozzy, who was from Pakistan. And it is, um, in Vonnegut wrote from the perspective of people from, you know, different cultures, ethnicities, um, and he, he intended to do that. He wanted to walk in the shoes of other people, people who were completely different from him. Um, I like Ozzy because, well, you interviewed someone from Pakistan. The chap my favorite chapter is the one about this character Ozzy trying to get out of Pakistan and, and what has happened there. This, I mean, it, that one chapter could be a movie in itself. Well, you're a Marine, so you like violence. And there was some <laughs> violence in that chapter. It so was like, excitement. I'm also a former newspaper person. There's a newspaper scenario in that chapter, which is, you know, the free press is, that's near and dear to, to me. But that is an incredibly action-packed chapter, and there's also romance in that chapter. Very, uh, the, probably the cleanest romance chapter you have in this book. The romance novel. Well, I mean, I'm not all that graphic. I'm gonna have some innuendos, but I am graphic once in a while. In the book, yeah. Do you, uh, are you all familiar with this racy book? I never read it. Called Fifty Shades of Grey. We got a couple copies that back there. Week, so. so, my wife has read that she or heard about it, mm -hmm. okay. and she told me when I was asking her about some of the sex in my book, she said, "Don't worry, it's only two shades of gray." <laughs> so it's not. It's racy, but not dirty. Maybe you shouldn't tell people that. Maybe you should say all oh, fifty shades are in here. <laughs> it is. <isn't. laughs> But it's about people, and people do things, so I do. Well, and um, I, I was trying to see if there was maybe a Vonnegut, oh, well, I'll tell you. I, I, I won't skip ahead, because there's, there's something that's kind of interesting here. Um, but okay, the next one was, every character should want something, even if it is only a glass of water. They should want something. So. The main character uh, is Alex. The character want to live forever. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's well, the... the basic theme of the book, and I don't want to give away anything, because I really hope that you'll buy a copy and enjoy it and read it. And on my emails in there, I told a friend of mine, I said, look, after you read it, you can be critical. It won't hurt my feelings. You can say something about it that's uh, critical. And so she wrote it and said something critical, and it hurt my feelings. <laughs> so, be careful with my fragile ego when you read the book. You email me if you like, I'd like, 
I love it. It's yeah, and it's not just Nikki. There's something you know. When I wrote my my Vonnegut book, um, when you when you actually publish a book, like my feeling was, <laughs> oh, I'm going to want people to learn more about Vonnegut, and of course that's part of it. But you're the one who picks and chooses how you approach these things, and 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 Mickey did the same thing in his book where. The things that you focus on are the things you value. You know, if you make somebody out to be a villain, you are giving examples of, you know, how that person is speaking or their actions to make them creepy or problematic. And like your your values are showing up. And that was the big surprise for me after my book came out is um, feeling like I'm sharing myself with the re I'm not just sharing knowledge. I'm sharing like I worked hard on that book. It was a real challenge for me and every writing writing is hard. It's really hard. I think even if it's fun getting it right over and over again the revisions. I mean, you know, her book at one point and it's just out so it might still be true was the fastest or best selling children's or elementary school book on Amazon. It, so for the day it was released, it was, or it was a few days, but yeah, it was the number one release for young adult biography on Amazon. That was really exciting. Um, I thought that might lead to like incredible sales. That is not exactly how it played out. Um, it's Mickey, Mickey's is, is self-published. Mine is not, but we've sold the same number of books despite the fact that I have a, you know, a wonderful publisher, um, Wiley, John Wiley and Sons, which, you know, is an education thing for the Dummies series and stuff. But there is a lot to be said for these days for self-publishing. Um, and I'll mention another thing. Mickey gets to keep a lot more of <laughs> the, the, the money that he makes from his work than I do. That, that's a Would you like to know what the plot is in my fiction book? I can uh, read a little bit of it. It says, it's called The Physical Gene. And, um, so this is kind of bragging. So, in the Methuselah Gene, Michael Mauer's mesmerizing medical thriller. Well, I wrote that, but I, I'm not. I hope you think it's mesmerizing, but it might not be mesmerizing. Okay, so I might use it a little too strong. In the Methuselah Gene, Michael Mauer's mesmerizing medical thriller, Alex Morton, a talented but unorthodox scientist, undertakes the care of little Jimmy Higgins who suffers from one of the rarest diseases in the world, progeria, a genetic mutation that grossly accelerates the aging process. Do you guys know anything about progeria? No, it's very rare. And a, a child ages right before your eyes, very, very, very quickly. By the time the child hits preteen, it the, the boy or girl looks like an old person. Um, Hair falling out, teeth rotting, eyesight back, uh, losing uh, arthritis. I mean, just like a guy nice. like me, and um, and dies in the early teens. So it's a horrible, horrible affliction. So it's about the, the first subplot here is about this little kid with progeria, and the doctor treats. Uh, the child. Alex, Alex's study of progeria yields staggering discoveries about the mother of all diseases, aging. He kind of thinks, well, wait a minute, I can stop this terrible disease, this aging process in this kid. Maybe I can stop or slow down aging in normal people like you and I. What Alex does not know is that Mother Nature jealously guards her secrets and that his newly developed therapies will lead to calamitous unintended consequences. Scary. And that's the fun part of this. That's the science fiction part of the book. So I, I that's what that's what my book's about. I hope you like it. And there's a chapter about the kind of more philosophy of uh, 
living forever and um, a panel, a conference, of, in a, con a conference on aging. And um, some of your personal philosophy comes out in there, but it's, you know, it's interesting to think about aging from the perspective of the environment. What does that mean if people lived another 100 years? Why don't you share that interesting fact about... Well, I read about it. I don't know if it's true. But uh, the, I think what you're referring to is the fact that a scientific journal said that the first person in the world to live to 150 has been born. And that's so interesting, that, right? Would that be you, maybe? Probably not. No? I think so. I, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Anyway, that is interesting. And many, many more people are living to 100 than ever before. So this has to do with aging. I, I kind of like the, the adventure, the excitement, and uh, and there's a little, as Julia said, there's a little violence and a little bit of sex, but it makes it kind of fun to read. Well, there's, um, let me see, I need to pull my phone up, but, but there's a great Vonnegut quote about um, readers and um, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question, and then I'm gonna look while you're answering this. So, Vonnegut, one of his uh, tips to writers is be a sadist. No matter how sweet, menacing your leading characters, make awful things happen to them in order that the reader may see what they're made of. So you have you have well, Alex. Yeah, we have some awful things. You have Alex. You have Betsy. Some some bad Mark things has happen. PTSD. From, from the Korean, or the Korean War. Korean War. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of sad. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it's, it's real people doing yeah. real things. Anybody have any questions so far? Um, what were some of the other books or um, sources of inspiration for wanting to write about aging. Were there other books or writers that you were reading that sort of got the ball rolling on that? Yeah, I, I didn't read other books on aging, but I read tons and tons of literature uh, from all sources, scientific and general reading. And I would uh, read something that I thought was germane to my topics and tear it up and pile it up on my credenza. And by the time I started writing, I must have had a pile about that high and that long. Uh, just a ton of stuff. And um, the more and more I read, the more I piled up, the more ideas I got. And so, yes, the answer is I had to do a ton of reading. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. Um, I had also bring myself up to date on biology. Did anybody take biology in high school? I, I didn't. But I talked to a biology, high school biology teacher when I was doing the research. So, so I had to read up on a lot of topics. And biology was one because I want the reader to understand basic high school biology. So that when I spring this uh, trap of uh, science fiction, you'll have the basic biology you need to understand what, where, where we're going with it. And so there's some of that basic biology. And, and then I, had, I talked to uh, lawyers, criminal lawyers, because there's some bad element in here. I talked to priests because there's some last rites and there's stuff like that. So, man, I talked to people, lists of people on and on to gather the information and the knowledge I needed to give you a good read. Yeah, I think I think that's amazing um, how much research you did to, to write that book. And you know, we throw out the term beach read, but it's it's a lot more than a beach read. There's um, there's a lot of philosophy, a lot of social justice in in the science, you know, but also it takes place in Indianapolis and, and parts of Zionsville and Carmel and, um, and other parts of the country and the world. Um, it's, you know, a lot of work went into Yeah, we were that. on the way down here, we passed the Tabernacle Church, 34th and Central, and that's a, and that's a Yeah, 
Yeah. Lots of local. lots of local places are referenced, and yeah. even individuals who are named in in a, you know not their actual I, names. I think it makes it a lot more fun for yeah. readers to say, "Oh yeah, I know, you know, I know about that. I've eaten there." Um, yeah, it makes it just an ele extra element of fun. Well, I think that's one of the reasons <laughs> why people would like Vonnegut because he has a Hoosier perspective, and yeah. that's that's what we are. That's what we call ourselves. I have an online question. Um, so my neighbor's Elizabeth had asked which you preferred writing more, nonfiction or fiction, now that you've had both. Well, uh, my ratio is six to one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um, if nice people buy my fiction book, if these people give me a vote of confidence, then I think I'm going to write another fiction book. Um, I left a few p characters out there in, that I can draw upon, so a sequel or a second edition uh, would work. But if my new friends here say, I don't think I want to bother with it, then maybe I'll go back to what I've done in the past. But I enjoy it, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, I did find that Vonnegut quote, because you mentioned, you know, there's, you know, there's some romance in your book, some you know some other things um but vonnegut said i try to keep deep love out of my stories because once that particular subject comes up it is almost impossible to talk about anything else readers don't want to hear about anything else they go gaga about love if a lover in a story wins his true love that's the end of the tale even if world war three is about to begin and the sky is black with flying saucers um, <laughs> so I don't think you're wrong to put a little bit of, of uh, romance in And that illustrates <laughs> why Vonnegut is such a hell of a better writer than I ever was. <laughs> so well, you've got a choice, you might want to buy Vonnegut. <laughs> One thing about my book, that so my book is multiple chapters about his life story, but then um, I, I take on Slaughterhouse-Five, the book Player Piano, and then the short story Harrison Bergeron, um, more of a, an analysis, but I'm not a, um, I guess this will be a tip for, for people who are, you know, becoming writers. Um, I was so insecure about writing this book because, um, I don't consider myself an academic, you know, I, I, I have, haven't been a professor or anything like that. And even though I'm the founder of the Vonnegut Library and I, I felt like, you know, I, I know the story, I've been capturing anecdotes for 10 years to put into a book, um, I was insecure intellectually. Oh, well, can I do this? And, and, uh, and well, and Mickey and, and other reviewers helped to make it <laughs> stronger with questions about, um, you know, if you're not a huge Vonnegut fan, I might have put something in there that was, a little too for insiders or something. It's like, wait, what does that mean? I don't get that. It's like, oh, of course, you know, if you're not a Vonnegut insider. And and most of the readers of this won't be. They'll be students who are just, you know, being assigned Vonnegut. <laughs> like, oh, here's Slaughterhouse Five. Let me see what that says. Like, well, yeah, another, <laughs> another good tip is don't be surprised. In order to get your writing right, you have to go through scads of drafts. I did 56 drafts of that book. And the funny part about it is the letter letter stages of that, you come up with really better creativity because you've got the book set and now you come up with some really fun things that you can add and make your book leap for you. So um, in writing in writing your book, be prepared that you're gonna have to be self-critical and go through many drafts get it right he's not kidding about the 56 drafts either and and he would you know write a chapter write another chapter review each time going back reviewing the whole thing um and i i wrote you know i did that with my book i didn't get 56 drafts out of mine but um it's it is amazing how uh, what you miss and and also that um importance of having other people read your work and, and early. One thing that I just kind of broke my heart about my book, there's this great Vonnegut quote about, um, well, he doesn't like critics, 
art critics, <laughs> music critics, and he said something to the effect of um, being an, a critic of the arts is like putting on a suit of armor and attacking a hot fresh sundae or a banana split. <laughs> And I thought I put that in the introduction of the book. Somehow, either it wasn't in the draft they sent, or I sent them, or it did, somehow it didn't make its way into the book. But then at the end of the book, where I was asked to write Why Study Vonnegut, I, I brought up, you know, and then you'll understand why he's like a hot fudge sundae or a banana split, but you don't have that quote from the beginning, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway. Well, now you know. Now you, you know <laughs> the folks out in cyber world. <laughs> Did you get another question? Yeah, I know for Julia, they asked if Slaughterhouse-Five is the book you'd recommend as a first Vonnegut, or is there a different first Vonnegut that you would recommend starting there? Um, what a great question, and thanks. Slaughterhouse-Five is, um, is important to understand what, how his war experience shaped his, everything in that became his life and his um, interest in social justice. Um, but that's not. Um, I actually like the. I like biography. That's what I. That's what I like is is writing biography and reading biographies. And um, so I would say the collected letters that Dan Wakefield put together. Those collected letters are Kurt Vonnegut's. I mean, they're his words, his actual letters to people, um, but then Dan Wakefield provided context between, you know, each letter. Um, so that tells the, you know, the story of Monty's life in his own words. Um, but yes, Slaughterhouse is really important. I, before I started the Vonnegut Library, I read God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, which is so much of Vonnegut's philosophy about just being kind, you know, just simple acts of kindness. Um, so that has a special place in my heart. Everybody's different, and my my colleagues over here who would, you know, they have other suggestions. Do you want to throw out your suggestions? Um, Cat's Cradle is the first book, I think, because it's really good, and the chapters are really short, so you can fly through it in like two hours, probably. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it was voted the, his favorite book last year in our body. Yes, so for Zoom folks, Cat's Cradle was one suggestion. And yeah, he creates his own religion um, based on his study of anthropology. How about you? I mean, my favorites, I always recommend Jailbird. Jailbird. kind of like a lot of people like, don't mean it's underrated, that's all I mean to say. Jailbird is underrated. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think honestly, you get a good taste of this political philosophy. Yes, the political philosophy shows up big time in, in Jailbird. It's just a fun read. Anything you pick up by Vonnegut is going to be good. Welcome to the Monkey House. The collection of short stories is also. Um, what is your book be a, a good first Vonnegut? I should say yes, in my book. I'm not a great. Um, well, I say I'm not a great self promoter. Some people might disagree with me. <laughs> Since here we are in, in, in degrees. Um, but yeah, this is, even though it is for a young adult audience, I wrote it for the way that I would read something. You know, I said, I'm not an academic, so. If um, I have to write a report on Vonnegut, would I, would I buy that book and kind of uh, copy what you wrote? <laughs> would I get an A in my uh, theme? I think if you didn't get an A, you get, you know, uh, some kind of <laughs> good effort <laughs> or something. Um, but let's go back to let's go back to you unless there were any other yeah. questions. Okay, um, um, <laughs> here's another one of it. So, write to please just one person. If you open a window and make love to the world, so to speak, your story will get pneumonia. <laughs> so, he Vonnegut wrote for one person. He said he uh, wrote for his sister Alice. That was the you know the person he had in mind. Um, even, you know, after she passed away and he, he took her children in and all of this. Um, but do you feel that you were writing for anybody? Were you writing for yourself? Were you writing for someone? Um, just telling the story. You've been collecting all this well, information. The funny part about it is I dedicate it to my grandchildren, but I won't let them read it. <laughs> Which so is so funny. I can't so say funny. I wrote it for them. It's, yeah, that's, that's very funny because, well, I guess I was going to say they're mostly um, in their teens and... Today, but yeah. yeah, 
but yeah. well, some of them are not. Some of them are elementary school children, yeah. <laughs> and the themes are a little bit, would be a little bit difficult for them. The themes of death and violence and sex and stuff that normal people experience on a day to day basis. So, uh, dedicated to my grandchildren, but not written with them in mind. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here's another Vonnegut thing. Give your readers as much information as possible, as soon as possible, to help with suspense. Readers should have such complete understanding of what's going on, where and why, that they could finish the story themselves should cockroaches eat the last food pages. So I don't agree with that. Um, I have some surprises in my book, and, and, uh, and I hope I've already had a bunch of people write me and say they loved the ending and I didn't expect it and it came out of left field and stuff like that. And and uh, I enjoy springing a few surprises. So I disagree with Vonnegut there. If cockroaches were to eat my last couple of chapters, um, as a reader, you'd be unhappy with me. Say, what the hell happened here? You know what what happened? And so I think it. I think the, it's fun to write. Is it fun to read a surprise? You know, there was a short story, you guys probably noticed it. I think it's called The Lady and the Tiger, but I'm not sure. I've read the theme more than once, but there was this guy in the room, it's a short story, and there were two doors, and if he opened one door, he was going to marry the princess and have half the kingdom. If he opened the other door, he was going to be eaten by a hungry tiger. And the story ended. And, and I looked and I looked and never told me which door he opened. So that's going to take the surprise a little too far for me and it haunts me to this day, which is probably the mark of a good writer. Which door did that guy open? Are you guys familiar with that book? I don't remember the name of it for sure, but um, there's another book by a great author, uh, James Hilton. He wrote, his famous book was Goodbye, Mr. Chips. It made it into a movie, and uh, maybe a number of his books were made into movies. And he wrote one called Lost Horizon, and that's where he turned the, the term Shangri-La. You probably heard the term Shangri-La. And it's about a guy who gets kind of kidnapped and taken to this extraordinary place in the Himalayas where instead of cold and ice and everything, it's paradise. And somehow his brother was with him. He gets locked out of leaving Shangri-La. That's what Shangri-La is. And uh, where, people, it's where people didn't, didn't grow old or very, very slowly and had a lovely uh, existence. And he left and regretted it, and the whole last part of the book, he's trying to get back to Shangri-La. That's all crazy things. And you know that darn book didn't tell you whether he made it back or not. <laughs> so you wonder, well, in my book, I have characters that are out there and people wonder what happened, what, what he's doing, etc. So um, I kind of like some of those writing techniques, suspense, surprise, um, but I think they're fun techniques for a writer. Yeah. Oh, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Today someone asked uh, both of you, uh, your process for writing, do you have a certain time of day, very strict way of writing, or do you have a very fluid way, they were just you know, kind of paraphrasing there, but just how you set about your goal of finishing your books. Um, so I, I'm a morning writer. I, I do it kind of whenever the time is available. You know, I'm pretty, pretty busy with the Bonnie at Library, and I'm a mom, and, um, and I have a side business where I edit manuscripts, and I give advice on that problems and stuff. But the, that morning is when I'm sharp and when I feel like I can think better. Um, but it's, I don't know, I mean, after writing this book and what Mickey said about the importance of revising and then just putting it down for a week or something and keeping it 
um, back up. It's, um, it's, I have come, even though I think writing is really hard, I've been a writer my whole life for like business related stuff and other things. And, but I, I love it so much now. And I have another book I'm, I'm going to be starting, um, this year. Um, again, something that I feel like is, is going to be more challenging than this, but yeah. How about you? Do you have a well, particular writing? I, I dictate my first draft. It's a stream of ideas, and I think that's good. They come out at me faster than I could have written them down, so it's better to dictate. And then, when I have that dictation, and maybe I do it chapter by chapter or two chapters at a time, and then from there on, I revise it with pen and ink, and then have it retyped and revise, revise as we talked about before. And I write better at night. And so not late at night, not 3 a.m., because I, I used to be pretty good, better than I am now of writing, but when I'm tired, uh, I don't write so well, but uh, if I can get home from work at uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock, 4.30, then maybe I have some time, or, or maybe after dinner, and where I can relax and write. So I like, I like writing in the evening. I think I'd be terrible trying to write first thing in the morning. That would that wouldn't work out for me. So um, I'm glad it works out for you. But not, <laughs> not for me. And then I cannot write with little bits of time. So I need block time to write. So you, uh, if I have an hour between appointments at my office, that is not for me. But if I sit down and I've got two or three hours. Then I can start to get into it, and I can get in the zone. I can, I can think about nothing else but my book, and it starts to take shape. And I'm losing track of time, and, and I'm really doing it. Block time is is my best way to write. And for me, an hour is my block time because <laughs> I gotta go pick up a kid from school or whatever it is. I get or take a kid to school. I guess. Can I follow up and ask just how long it took? both of you to get to those routines? Like, if you had trial and error, what, you know, what your process was to get to your current writing? Yeah, routine? well, this is my seventh book, and so um, it, it it took me a while to learn where I make the best contribution to the endeavor. And um, so when I first started out, it was a compilation of underwater photography. It's a book called watercolors and that was that's kind of the easy entryway to write so I, I didn't need to develop writing skills that way maybe they have them here it's that book here it's uh, long long ago out of print but then as I started getting into the biography books um, and, uh, and the football book and some of the other things that I was doing then I realized I would sit down I got an hour before dinner I didn't get anything. I didn't get anything. Uh, I wasn't deep enough into it. I think you can make the analogy of when you go to sleep and you don't get much out of your sleep until you get into a deeper sleep. REM, they used to call it. I don't know what that's called. Um, I, get, I just don't get into my book. And I learned that by trial and error, as you suggested. So if you, if you, uh, if, I, if I would spend 45 minutes trying to write something, nah. Time. I can revise in a, maybe a couple hours because I know my material and I can fix grammatical errors. I don't need block time to do that or replace a word that's just trite. Because when you when you and I would talk, you might say something, an idiom that's that's kind of trite. You know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That doesn't belong in a creative piece. So if you, there are things that in your dialogue, unless you purposely want to invest that that character with a dialogue that's trite, you can do that. But when you're telling your story um, and you're dictating it, a lot of times it's regular parts of speech come in that you and I would use together, but wouldn't belong in the book. So you've got to read your book with that. And um, and then um, adverbs. We use adverbs a lot when we talk to one another. Adverbs, um, 
don't convey the messages in the book the way you should. I go back and go on a witch hunt for adverbs. And because adjectives uh, tell a story much better than adverbs. If I said, he was very, very mad, I'll come back and take out both berries. Um, she, you know, stuff like that. So uh, those kind of revisions, I don't need major block time to do that. It's trying to improve. Um, and one more thing on that. This is the lady that will tell you whether that's true or not. But I'll sit up in bed in the middle of the at three o'clock in the morning and say, "Oh my God, what a great idea!" And I know that if I don't write it down, come seven o'clock, I won't know what the heck I was talking about. So. I'll write, a, I'll write an idea down at 3 o'clock in the morning and then see it again. And then most of the time, oh yeah, I'll incorporate that in my book. So that's part of writing too. It possesses you. And then for me, it was more looking back on, it, it's been a self-discovery thing. For, I don't have seven books behind me the way that he did. Um, so it's, you know, I'm still learning um, about myself that way. But one thing we have in common um, is that we don't spend a lot of time, like, watching shows and stuff. Like, I, especially after writing this book, like, I just want to um, get those ideas out, even if it's something that I don't plan to write for many years or you know, just some crazy idea that I might never do anything with. Um, I just, I just have reprioritized my time that way, and and even things like just being on my phone, surfing the internet, or reading the news. Um, I used to do that so much more, and now I just have to be very uh, conscientious about not wasting time in ways that I feel like are, you know, waste. Uh, we've, we've held you from two, it's now almost three. <laughs> and I was just thinking, you obviously came together, and if you would buy my book, you'd only buy one copy of my right so far. <laughs> yes? So I'm going to buy two different books. Yeah. Two oh, books. they're going to buy two different books. That's a good one. Get the fiction yeah, for the year. Yeah. Well, so I have, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So I've been teaching 26 years, and I have 26 years of experience here. Yeah. And a friend of mine and I were like, "Yeah, we need to write a book. We need to write a book." And I'm like, "It's never going to be written." And I'm just trying to think the best way to get me over that. That's a mental thing. It is. Uh, over uh, how 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 can I get started? Just writing down those ideas that I have in my head, because I you know in my head I'm like how am I going to organize the 26 years of what I've done and what. What subject do you teach? I'm teaching art. I'm still teaching art. Yeah. Where? Cool. Uh, in New Palestine, I teach elementary, and we teach. What's called teaching for artistic behavior, which is a, it's the classroom is set up as a studio, and um, a lot of people are interested in it. Yeah. And there's there's two books that colleagues of mine have written, and then so I was like, well, you know, we can do it too. Um, oh, you must have tons of anecdotes, and you must have lots of examples of, of art produced by your students and you. I mean, there's all kinds. Of, you can start by listing all the ideas you have. Tons of, I bet there's just tons of opportunity to write about some of your 26 years. I would start by listing all of those. Kind of take an inventory and put it down on paper. That would be a good start. And then, you gotta, obviously, you don't have the self confidence you need to start it, but you just started it already. So you gotta build your self confidence. I think that you do that by maybe starting uh, to write, because I'll bet you're a good writer after all these years. So, I well, would... I've written things in magazines and stuff, right. but it's you know a journal article is different than yeah, a, a paperback book. Yeah, I continue 
to write real good comments. That, hey, I can write. People like what I've written. I think that's that's a good idea. And then one day you sit down and say, I'm going to turn off the television, kick your significant other out of the room, close the door. It's my daughter. Okay. So you can tell that you're nameless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I made that mistake because I think you look young, not the best. <laughs> nice thing. You have, you have a very pretty young daughter. Um, and so, um, get, your, get your daughter out of the room, close the door, and have some peace and quiet. And uh, either, however you like to do it, I would dictate, but it would dictate or start going. The best way to write is to learn how to write and be a writer is to write. Yeah, I echoed that, and I'll mention. So when uh, when I was offered this opportunity to write this book, they said it, it's. I won't go into all the background about why it came to be this way, but they said you have three months. If you're going to ask for an extension beyond three months, even for a day, don't sign this contract because we have a deal. You know, we've we've got to produce this book in three months, we'll find some other writer if you can't do it. So I didn't have the luxury of like, oh, a year from now I'll be like, I had three months. I would say, give yourself a month to at least start an outline of what you want those chapters to look like, even if you go back and change it all later. Just the, the starting part will advance your project. And, um, you know, a lot of times publishers, if you did send something to them, they would say, okay, we'd like to see, you know, the outline, the chapter, the table of contents, um, maybe the first and second chapter. Just, I mean, I would take it, I would take it like that. I wrote the introduction first because in my mind, I had to figure out where, why am I doing this? Where am I going with this? And there would be something in that introduction that helped me to think about the important things about Vonnegut that mattered to focus on in the rest of the book. So I, I wrote that introduction long before I, I did anything else. But not everybody's like that. And I'm know? not like that, and I don't think that's necessarily the best way to do it. For you, um, the trouble getting into this, the trouble getting started. I write my favorite anecdote, my favorite yeah, that's chapter a good piece first. Of advice. That'll be the best way to get you into writing and into, into getting you started. So during 26 years, there's got to be a story that you love to tell. And I don't know what that story is, but write that first. That'll get you moving. I think that's great advice, and I, I did that. I didn't write this in a linear way. I, I did the things that I, I felt like I could really make a contribution to, you know, new information about Vonnegut that's not in any of the other books or documentaries um, that, you know, I was excited about. Um, so. Do you know what chapter was my very first chapter that I wrote? Was it Betsy in college? No. Oh. <laughs> I would have thought that. So, one of the things I read about in these scientific journals is these species who extend their lifespan, like you can extend, extend the lifespan of a fish by putting it in colder water. You can extend the lifespan uh, of another animal by putting them on a near starvation diet. They live there. But what happens is they become sterile. Mother Nature said, okay, if you're going to live longer, then you can't have as many offspring. It's just the balance. So my character, my main character, in the first chapter I wrote was my main character, figuring this out, goes to a sperm bank and donates sperm <laughs> so that when he becomes uh, sterile or infertile, and wants to have a family, he's got something going, thinking ahead. But I wrote what I thought was a very funny chapter, and I laughed and laughed and laughed reading it. Um, and I think you will too, and that was, and that got me started, that just like I suggest you do. I picked, I picked what I thought would be the funnest thing, and I wrote that first. So that's, I've taken my own advice.
And it, that is a that is a funny and chapter. It was funny. And there, I mean, there is a lot of humor in this book generally. I mean, there's some very funny things, and um, and I don't think it's bad. I mean, I'm proud of my book. I don't think it's bad to be proud of the stuff that you do or to laugh at your own stuff. Is it's um, there are there are so many critics out there, and it's funny too. I know Mickey had the same experience, like the people who will say, no kidding, like there is a typo. <laughs> and it's like the person reads my book and the thing they want to share about it is the typo, which, and you think, oh, well, your ego can't handle it. Yeah, my ego can handle it. It's just, would you go out to some famous writer and say, oh, you know, John Green, I noticed you had a typo on page 89. And it's like, <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. Or, or think of even, you know, more famous than, you know, than even, John Green and stuff like you would if you were talking you know what I mean you'd want to say and that's what I said about you're putting yourself out there as a writer like you want people to get that you've labored for this that there's something that you're contributing that nobody else has done before and, and Mickey's book is this I mean he's he's contributed some things that like nobody's ever thought of before but interestingly for Jiria, I don't know if you want to mention where we are with the development of the cure for progeria. Well, it's, an, it's an ironic that part of the book talked about the search for the defective gene that causes progeria. That's pure science fiction. Except for the time when I first, from the time when I first started writing to the time it, it, the book came out, scientists did find that defective gene. So science fiction became reality. And, moving very fast. So anyway, it's after three, and so I don't want to keep you guys any longer, unless you refuse to buy a book. <laughs> and then we'll just keep chatting until we If you don't buy a book, you have to sit here another yes. hour and listen to us go on and on and on. So, um, would, you, would you please buy a book and enjoy it? <laughs> what do they cost? Uh, well, I think, was it, I guess I better look. I get the hardback, you're the self What are you selling the books for? Oh, that, let's see. Are, is it 1995? Um, so, yeah, so unless there we'll are any other questions, yeah, we will, we'll sign, like. we'll sign the books. Yeah. And, um, and I just want to thank those who are online for joining us as well today. And, We'll have um, signed copies available as well for those who couldn't make it. We'll have you guys sign a few extra if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and thanks very much. Absolutely. Um, to thank you. And I like these guys, so I'll tell you what I'll do. If they buy um, <laughs> one of my books, Two. I'll buy the Crossroad Puzzle book from you. And oh, you okay. oh, there you oh. go. <laughs> well, that's nice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.